Hello friends and welcome back to another week of 3ABN Sabbath School panel as we're making our way through our study on the great controversy. We've made it, as I said before, to the halfway point. We're in lesson number seven and this week it's entitled Motivated by Hope. And so uh, we're definitely going to be looking at the second coming of Jesus, which is one of my favorite topics. So let me introduce our panelists at this time. To my left is Pastor John Lomacain. And I'm dealing with anticipating the time of the second return of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. To your left is Pastor Johnny Denzi. Uh, I'm blessed to be here as well and I have Tuesday William Miller and the Bible. All right. Interesting study. Pastor James Rafferty, always a blessing to have you. Good to be here, Ryan. I'm picking up where John left off. The 2300 days of Daniel 814 is Wednesday's lesson. Ah, oh, okay. All right. Praise the Lord. And of course, last but not least, Professor Dr. Uh, just a, a surgeon in the Bible. Appreciate you always, Brother Daniel Panner. Perrin. Excuse Thank me. you. I am. I have Thursday's lesson, which connects to the 2300 days, the longest prophetic timeline. All right. It's going to be interesting to see how we get through the 2300 years in 20 minutes, but that's going to be great. Um, you know, this week we're going to be diving into, as I said, the second coming of Jesus. And um, I, I, I'm just, I'm thrilled and excited to be talking about this because it seems like all Bible prophecy is just gravitating towards this one event. And of course, I love the title of this lesson, Motivated by Hope, because that's what it should be. Not motivated by fear, but by the love and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And we're hopefully going to make that clear uh, this week in the lesson. So uh, without further ado, let's have a prayer and let's go to Pastor Johnny Dinsey. You mind praying for us? Yes, let's all go right. to the Lord prayer. Our wonderful and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We approach your throne of grace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the Holy Scriptures and we ask that you will guide us and help us in this study. Bless us with the Holy Spirit and we pray, Lord, for light to shine from this panel throughout the world. We pray for your blessing upon all those that stop to listen and view this program, we pray that your blessing will pour out to them and help them to draw close to you. We ask you in the holy and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Before we get right into our content, I do want to remind our viewers that um, you can actually get a copy of our notes, the panelists' notes from week to week. If you want a copy of those notes and want to be able to study along with us, uh, simply send us an email to ssp at 3abn.org. Again, that's ssp at 3abn.org. And uh, you'll sign up and you'll get those lessons from week to week as we release those. So appreciate all of you who have done that so far. I'm going to actually jump right into Sunday's lesson because Sabbath afternoon is really just setting the tone for what it is we're going to discuss. And I want to give each of you obviously an opportunity to uh, give us that information afresh. But I want to jump right into Sunday's uh, topic, which is the promise of his return and focus in on the importance of and the significance of why we're looking forward to the soon coming of Jesus. Of course, the Bible has us going directly to that wonderful, famous, notorious passage in John chapter 14, first three verses. And uh, if you've never heard them before, maybe there's someone at home right now uh, that is hearing this information for the very first time in their life. Sometimes I think we assume that because most of our viewership are returning viewers or professed Christians, uh, there's always the possibility that someone is hearing the Word of God for the very first time as they have turned to this channel or as they're tuning into this program. And I want to read it as if you're hearing it for the very first time. Beautiful, powerful promise in God's word. Jesus, our Savior, our Creator, says these words. He says, let not your heart be troubled. We live in a world that can give us a lot of trouble, give us a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressures. And the circumstances around us and our environment can cause lots and lots of uh, crazy feelings and, and give us an, a sense of uncertainty moving forward in our times. But Jesus says, do not be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. That's for every single one of us. Jesus has went away to prepare us a place. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be 
also. Now, for the person who may be hearing this for the very first time, obviously uh, there's prerequisites to entering the kingdom of God. And we've talked a lot about those. We must believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We must fully surrender to him and allow him to do his sanctifying work in our life. But he says, if you place your full trust in him, if you make him number one in your life, if you make him complete Lord and Savior of your life, then he has promised you that if I tell you I'm going to go away, I'm going to go away and I'm going to return again because I've prepared a place for you that where I am, wherever I am, there you may be also. And we want to be with him in his kingdom. And I want to ask all of us, do we really truly believe that promise? We've read those texts. Many of us have heard that, that passage many, many times. And I want to ask the viewers at home, do you seriously and genuinely believe in that promise? Are we living our lives each and every day as if we're living out the conviction that Jesus is indeed coming very soon? Um, I want to dive into a few texts here that set the foundation for why it is that we look forward to this soon return. And of course, we're going to look at the motivation of the fact that, you know what, there's a promised resurrection. There, in this life, all we've known is death. All we've known is sorrow and pain and all of the things that accompany it and come with it. But Jesus says, you know what, at the end of the day, you place your trust in me. And though you may die, if you believe in me and trust in me and put your hope in me, then there is a coming day at my return. When the Lord returns, he says, I will resurrect the dead in Christ. Now, I want to go first to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 through 19 and read those texts there as we have a beautiful promise there. And it gives us the foundational hope and why we look for one of the reasons why we look forward to the soon coming of Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 to 19, it says, Now, if Christ is preached that he has risen, or excuse me, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? He says, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. I'm just reminded as I'm reading this of the fact that, yes, we put a lot of hope in what Christ did at the cross. We put a lot of hope in, and, and praise God for the death of Jesus and him taking upon himself the penalty that we deserved and dying that death that is needed to pay the penalty for the breaking of God's holy law. But yet at the end of the day, all of that would have been in vain had Christ not risen yeah. from the grave and defeated death. And so it goes on in verse 15. It says, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, but because we have testified of God that he raised, he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead did not rise. And then verse 16, he says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And so now take what we just learned about how we must place our hope in the risen Savior, that because Christ was risen, we also have the hope in the fact that resurrection is possible for us. And tie that to the, te the testimony that we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul writes very clearly that we have to look forward to that hope indeed because of what Christ has done. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to start with verse 13. Of course, the church at Thessalonica, they had communicated clearly to Paul as he did a lot of talking about the coming Savior and the hope that Jesus would come back and return and, and gather the saints and gather those who are ready to be with him. But they said, Paul, what about those who placed their hope and trust in Jesus, but have fallen asleep in Christ, who are dead and buried in the graves? What about our loved ones? What about our friends and our family members? And Paul says right here in verse 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He says, you have hope. You have hope in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died, here it is. He's making the point. If Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of our Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, there's not waves of people going into heaven at different times. We all get to go together. Those who are alive when Christ comes back and those, of course, who will be resurrected. Of course, we find this uh, solidified in the following verses. Verse 16 and onward, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead 
in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then I love how he ends this passage in verse 18. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, we live in a world today uh, where people try to comfort one another with things that are not consistent with the word of God. Uh, lies and deceptions that are not in harmony with the testimony of God's word pertaining to how we must go on and be with the Lord. Many people believe it's going to happen at the point of death. And I just want to give a clear plug here. When you die, you sleep in Christ in the grave until the appropriate resurrection. That's and right. in this case, uh, the, the righteous who have put their hope in Christ, they have the promise and the hope that when Jesus returns at his second coming, that you can indeed, though you may have died, will be resurrected when that time comes. So notice how the hope of resurrection is deeply tied to the return of Jesus Christ. Christ. Uh, you know, I want to read Great Controversy, page 302 here. It's a powerful verse or powerful quote here. It says, The coming of the Lord has been in all ages the hope of his true followers. The Savior's parting promise upon Olivet that he would come again, lighted up the future for his disciples, filling their hearts with joy and hope that sorrow could not quench nor, uh, nor trials dim. Amid suffering and persecution, the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, was the blessed hope. Mm -hmm. When the Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonian Christians were filled with grief, grief as they buried their loved ones, who had hoped to live to witness the coming of the Lord, Paul, their teacher, pointed, to, pointed them to the resurrection to take place at the Savior's advent. I love that. Then the dead in Christ should rise and together with the living be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then of course she quotes the scripture we just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. I also want to just read here from uh, Titus chapter 2 because we have the hope of his return uh, that should motivate us to want to live as he lived. Of course, we have the hope of resurrection, but the, the second coming should motivate us to want to live as Christ lived. Notice Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Powerful verses. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. I know that I want to make sure that I'm in that number. And we know that Christ has tarried. That coming has not come yet because he's waiting on us. He's waiting on his church. He's waiting on his people to reflect his character. And, uh, you know, I just want to motivate those and encourage those at home that uh, because you're still here and you're drawing the breath of life, we are motivated by the hope that Christ is indeed coming. But we have the time now to make sure that we reflect the light of Jesus in the days that we are given on this earth. Thank you so much, Amen. Ryan. And I'm dealing with a topic called anticipating the time. Now, the time of the return of Jesus has been a quandary to many people because they have somehow tried to predict what the Bible says, no man knows the day nor the hour. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. And uh, when we look at the evolution of the different belief systems uh, surrounding the return of Jesus, we find two major schools. One believes that Jesus Christ will come before the, before the rapture uh, and um, after the millennium. And you find the word rapture there is not referred to in the context today. We use the word rapture. That means, well, what do you mean by that? Some people believe in the snatching away of the Christian church. In other words, you might be on a plane, driving a car, at the supermarket having dinner, and all of a sudden one of the spouses disappear with one of the children. Well, people believe that that is what the rapture would be. This was an evolutionist ideology that started in the Dark Ages when the Catholic Church commissioned two Jesuits, one uh, Luis de Alcazar and uh, Francisco Ribera. Now, Francisco Ribera came up with the pre- Luis de Alcazar came up with the post. One believed that, well, the rapture already happened 
The other one said it's going to come. They didn't call it the rapture. They called it the gap theory, later known as the dispensational theory. And then it continued to evolve. It kind of went under the ground. But the reason why they formulated that is because the reformers of the Dark Ages looked at Rome and said they fit all the descriptions of the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7. So the church made an attempt to refocus the people away and say, well, the Antichrist is coming way in the future and we have nothing to do with that. It evolved uh, to another man by the name of Emmanuel Lacunza, who decided to take this theory and develop it even farther. And then John and Darby in England, when he embraced this dispensational ideology, his fellow theologians had imposed upon him to abandon it, saying it has no scriptural support. Mm. And he chose not to do so. And he was banished from among what I might refer to as the Protestant reformers of his day. But it didn't die. A lady by the name of uh, Margaret MacDonald embraced that here in America and started proliferating that, only to be picked up by another man by the name of Cyrus I. Schofield, from which we get the Schofield Bible, which is replete with study notes that try to connect and make you believe that, well, Jesus is coming secretly. He's going to establish his kingdom on earth. And then it got its biggest push in modern times in the 1980s and 70s by a man by the name of Hal Lindsey, oh. late great planet Earth. And uh, people started thinking that book sold millions, millions and millions. And he pushed many, many dates where he believed that Jesus would come and take the church away. Well, when one date failed, he went to another and another and another and another and another. And uh, it continued until the largest push under the series called Left Behind, when I say the only thing left behind was the truth. And uh, we had Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins that sold 50 to 60 million books. But if you pick up one of those, you may have one in your house. Don't look at the front cover. Pick up that thick book and look on the back cover in the bottom left. And you'll see these small word, this single little word, fiction. It was sold as legitimately the gospel. But in fact, it's just a dramatized fiction of something that as uh, National Geographic did a one hour expose, they said, this has no scriptural support, yet millions of Christians believe that somehow those who are ready for the coming of Jesus will disappear. And that's why they don't teach Revelation the way that we do, because they believe in Revelation chapter 4 when the Bible says, and I heard a sound from heaven and a trumpet says, come up hither or come up here. They believe that that's the visible, that's the, the secret calling away of the church to go to heaven and leave everyone on earth for seven years to somehow get a second chance. Well, there's no second chance theology in scripture because in the days when the antediluvians were destroyed, there was no another boat waiting to float after that flood was done. They were all killed in the flood. The flood came and took them all away. Only those within the ark were found safe. And then this ideology that the rapture says, well, if you don't make the first round, you got seven more years to get together. The Jews will be converted and convert the world. It's hogwash to just be very candid about it. It's not based on scripture. When you follow the Bible, you clearly see that even some of the early Adventist believers, they didn't believe in the earthly reign, but William Miller, and you're going to be talking about that. I won't take that from you. Some of them had they look forward to the coming of the Lord, but they made the mistake of setting dates. And by the way, and you'll build on that, William Miller was a Baptist and he was an Adventist, but not a seventh day Adventist because Adventist simply means looking for the second coming of Christ. The Adventist church, the seventh day Adventist church was not yet established. And you'll talk about what happened after that. So you see today this whole ideology that there's going to be a secret rapture, the church is going to be taken away, is not supported by scripture. But let me just help you understand what the word dispensation means. Because when you hear that phrase, which is pushed in Schofield Reference Bible, they believe that there were seven dispensations, that the church was broken down into the seven dispensations, meaning, this is strange, when the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and Tomorrow. forever. He doesn't change. But dispensationalism says, well, he had seven different ways, seven different ways of dealing with his people. They say first it was the age of innocence. They talk about the antediluvian days, but then they couldn't have been innocent because they died in the flood. Then the age of conscience, they talked about Abraham's time when the gospel was awakened through Abraham's faith. Abraham believed God. Then they have the human government. They talk about the structuring of the church in the Old Testament through the prophets and through the kings. 
Then they talk about the time of promise, where the promise of the coming Messiah was uh, prognosticated through Isaiah and, and Micah and various Old Testament prophets. Then they talk about the age of law, which they specifically applied to the Jewish people. They said, well, since we're not Jews, now we are in the age of grace. And they love that passage in Romans 6, verse 14 says, for you are not under law, but under grace. But they fail to realize that is not about God's law being done away with because sin still exists. It's simply talking about the power that sin has over us. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What law? The law of sin and death that controls the fallen human nature. But that's how they try to justify. And the last one, they call it, the last dispensation, they call it the earthly kingdom. Now listen carefully. This is why today there's such a push in the evangelical community to make the world right and moral. They want to make the world moral by passing law after law after law because they firmly are convinced that Jesus is coming again to reign on the earth for a thousand years. And it's up to us mm. to have a great relationship with the Jews mm. because he's coming to convert them. Yeah. And scripture doesn't support that at all. Jesus said to the Jews, your house is left to you desolate. And Paul the apostle says, since you reject eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And in Galatians it says, in Christ is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. Every one of us has an opportunity to be saved. So this dispensationalist ideology that Christ is going to come and establish his kingdom on earth and reign here for a thousand years is unsupported in scripture. When the second coming occurs, all the righteous are taken. Those in the graves that are righteous were resurrected to go to heaven to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. The wicked that are alive are to slay by the brightness of his coming and the wicked in the graves don't come forth until the thousand years are finished, Revelation 20 verse five. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. So there's no body on earth. Satan is bound for a thousand years. Why? Because there's no one here to tempt That's the right. weakness of dispensationalism. So what does the Bible say about the return of Jesus? Acts chapter one, verse nine to 11. Yep. Let's see what the scripture says. Amen. Now, when he had spoken these things, that's when Jesus spoke in these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Those were angels who said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. Not coming back invisibly, but the same way you saw him go, he's coming back. Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, those responsible for his crucifixion. They said, We adjure you, are you the Christ? And he said, I am and you'll see me coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Right. So there's somewhat of a special resurrection to show them these are not crowns of thorns. These are crowns of glory. You killed me. Here I am. And I'm not bound by your rules any longer. And when he comes to prove the visibility, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And lastly, Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's why Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. So friends, dispensationalism is nothing more than sationalism. Let the word of God be the foundation on which you base the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. No one knows the day nor the hour, but it's more important than the Super Bowl and any championship. Why would Jesus sneak back with the glorious event of the ages. Mm. Wow. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor, for that awesome lesson. My friends, we're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three Abian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3AB and Sabbath School panel. We're going to toss it over to Pastor Johnny Denzi for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much. And I do have Tuesday, William Miller and the Bible. 
And, you know, God has used people throughout the ages, people who would humble themselves before him. He would bless them in such a way so that they would understand the scriptures. And let's go ahead and talk a little bit about him. Yes, he was uh, a Baptist farmer and uh, living in the U.S. Uh, in the 1700s, uh, there was a time when uh, he needed to learn to read. Schools were not available because the country was rather new. So he learned to read at home. His mother taught him. He was nine years old when he first entered into school. And after the ninth year that he entered into school, then he would only go to school about three months out of the year. But at the age of 14, he became anxious to obtain books to read. He loved to read. As a matter of fact, he only had two books and he kept reading them over and over again. And he really enjoyed reading. And I'm going to read to you from his memoir. It says, I was never settled and happy until I came to Jesus Christ. While I was a deist, I believed in a God, but I could not, as I thought, believe the Bible was the word of God. Hmm. Why was this? Because the influence of friends and things he read about the Bible. Notice what he says in the memoirs on page 9, volume 1, page 9. The history of religion as it had been presented to the world and particularly by the historians of the 18th century was but a history of blood, tyranny, and oppression in which the common people were the greatest sufferers. I viewed it as a system of craft rather than of truth. Besides, the advocates of Christianity admitted that the Bible was so dark and intricate that no man could understand it. Reveal his will? which we cannot understand and then punish us for disobedience? How can such a being be called either wise or good? But still he believes in God. But the time comes because of the situations he was going through that to him, he says, the heavens were as brass over my head and the earth as iron under my feet. Eternity, what was it? And death, why was it? And then the time comes when the Lord finally reaches him. He says, I was truly wretched but did not understand the cause. I murmured and complained, but knew not of whom. I felt that there was a wrong, but knew not how or where to find the right. I mourned, but without hope, I continued in this state of mind for some months. Hmm. And, guess, and, then, and then it says at length, when brought almost to despair, God by his spirit opened my eyes. I saw Jesus as a friend hmm. and my only help and the word of God as the perfect rule of duty. Jesus Christ became to me the chiefest among 10,000. And the scriptures, which before were dark and contradictory, now became the lamp to my feet and a light to my path. My mind became settled and satisfied. I found that the Lord God to be a rock in the midst of the ocean of life. The Bible now became my chief study. And I can truly say I searched it with great delight. Mm. And it was as he done this that the Lord began to open to him the scriptures. And he says, I wonder why I had not seen its beauty and glory before and marvel that I could ever have rejected it. I found everything revealed that my heart could desire and a remedy for every disease of the soul. I lost all taste for other reading and applied my heart to get wisdom from God. So what did he do? He says, I laid aside uh, all commentaries, former views and pre pre-possessions and determined to read and try to understand for myself. I then began the reading of the Bible in a methodical manner, starting from Genesis. He grabbed a notebook and began to read and comparing scripture with scripture. He began to learn many wonderful things. And who is it that God is willing to teach? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9 and 10 says, Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And this is how the Lord led William Miller to search the scriptures. Notice Proverbs chapter 8, verse 9 and 10. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. We encourage you to study the scriptures, ask the Lord to help you understand it, and he is willing to teach all who come unto him. But how? How should we come to him? Notice Psalm 25, verse 9. The humble 
he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. And so we need to come to the Lord humble as children, asking him to help us understand. Verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. John chapter 16, verse 13. This is a wonderful truth available to you and to me today. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak of his own authority, but what, whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. And so William Miller studied the scriptures and he discovered the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, a more sure word of prophecy. It says in the King James Version, Which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. We also have a more sure word of prophecy, where unto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day start arising in your hearts. That's the King James Version. Hmm. And now 2 Peter 1, 21 and 20. Yeah, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the lesson brings out, as William Miller compared Scripture with Scripture, the mysteries of the Bible were open to him. He searched as one searching for a hidden treasure and was richly rewarded. The Holy Spirit opened the Word of God to his understanding. He approached prophecy with the same diligence in Bible study as the other biblical passages he was studying. So William Miller, uh, uh, a, a student of the Word, uh, I read now to you from the lesson, Mark Finley, stating the following, the symbols in the prophetic books are not locked in mystery. Mm -hmm. A loving God has given us his prophetic word to prepare us for the climatic event soon to unfold in the world. William Miller clearly understood that prophecy was its own best interpreter. The Bible is his own best interpreter. The symbol of prophecy are made clear by the Bible itself. Beasts, represent the kings or kingdoms, Daniel 7, 17 and 23. Wind represents destruction, Jeremiah 49, 36. Water represents people or nations. You can see Revelation 17, 15. A woman represents the church. And of course, a pure woman represents the church and an impure woman represents an apostate church. And then uh, you can see in Ephesians, uh, no, Jeremiah 6, 2 and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 32. The time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation are also given in symbolic language, which one prophetic day representing one literal year. Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. As William Miller applied these principles of biblical interpretation, he was startled at what he discovered regarding what he believed to be the timing of Christ's return. And notice, even from the um, William Miller's memoir, Volume 1, page 11, I found on a close, careful examination of the scriptures that God had explained all the figures and metaphors in the Bible or had given us rules for their explanation. And in so doing, I found to my joy and as I trust with everlasting gratitude to God that the Bible contained a system of revealed truths so clearly and so simply given that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. And I discovered that God had in his word revealed times and seasons, and in every case where time has been revealed, every event was accomplished as predicted. And then it finishes by saying, in the time and manner, therefore, I believed all would be accomplished. So he believed that Jesus Christ was coming very soon, even in his day. And you're going to hear more about this as we continue in this lesson. 
Thank you, Pastor Denzi. I have Wednesday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and we are just going to continue on that same uh, lane there. The 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14. Uh, the quarterly says, William Miller observed that events predicted by the prophets were precisely fulfilled. The 400 years of the sojourn of Abraham's descendants, Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the 70 years of Israel's captivity, and Daniel's 70 weeks allotted to Israel. Genesis 15.13. Numbers 14.34, Jeremiah 25.11, and Daniel 9.24. So the quarterly goes on to tell us, read Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Galatians 4, verse 4, and Romans 5, verse 6. What do these verses tell us about God's timetable for the first advent? And what we find here is that the New Testament supports what the Old Testament teaches. William Miller accepted a popular view about the cleansing of the sanctuary that was the purification of the earth by fire. And that wasn't really in the New or the Old Testament. It was just what people thought about the interpretation of the sanctuary. It's the earth and it's going to be cleansed by fire. That's what it means that the sanctuary is going to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 day prophecy. So he got the timetable right, but he got the event wrong. And they went through a tremendous disappointment, but all of that was predicted in the prophecies. Daniel, excuse me, Revelation chapter 10 pointed this out, sweet in the mouth, bitter in the stomach. And so as they continued to study these prophecies, they began to make connections to the timeline of the 2300 day prophecy and the 70 week portion in Daniel chapter nine. They began to see a connection between the two because basically Daniel didn't understand the 2300 day portion of that prophecy in Daniel chapter 8. And then the angel came and answered a prayer to help him to understand that time prophecy, that part of the prophecy that dealt with time that was to be fulfilled somewhere in the future to his time and his people. That prophecy was specific to the Messiah. And I think uh, Daniel Perrin's going to talk a little bit more about that, but let's just touch on this a little bit. The quarterly tells us we need to read these verses in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, and uh, again another verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Why? Because they use a word that's very significant. Let's just look at the first verse here Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus is speaking here right after his baptism. And Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, Jesus Christ is talking here about a specific type of time. In the Greek, the word here is set or proper time. It's different than the word for time in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. So Jesus here is actually directing people to the 70 week prophecy, which predicted his anointing with the Holy Spirit, which is uh, outlined for us in Acts chapter 10. And of course, Mark talks about it. Excuse me, Luke talks about it in Acts chapter 10 and because he's the author of Acts and he talks about it also in Luke chapter 3. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Jesus went to be baptized in the Jordan as everyone else was being baptized. And when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him and anointed anointed him. That's what the word Christ means, the anointed. In the Old Testament, the word Messiah means the anointed. The 70 week prophecy is bookmarked by two dates, the command to go forth and restore uh, Israel, Jerusalem, the city, and the anointing or the, uh, the christening of Christ. In other words, the Holy Spirit coming down and anointing Christ, making him the Christ or Messiah in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now, if you look up historically the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, and we're going to be looking at a lot of dates. I'm just going to put a plug in for this book, Messiah. You can order this from 3ABN. All the information we're talking about is in this book. And of course, a lot more than, than what we'll actually be talking about. But if you go to the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, you're going to find that that year is the year 27 AD. And we're told in the 70 week prophecy that there would be 483 prophetic days or 483 literal years to the anointing of Jesus. So we not only have two bookends, the first of which you can go forward to the date for uh, 27 AD and then forward to uh, 1844. But we also have another bookend and that is 27 AD, from which you can walk backwards 483 years. And when you walk backwards 483 years from 27 AD, guess where you land? You land at 
457 BC. So in both places, we have a confirmation of the smaller prophecy that lays the foundation for the larger 2300 day prophecy. And that's why Jesus is speaking here after his baptism in Mark chapter one, that the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's why we find him in John seven, verses six and seven. You wanna write down these verses, John seven or six and eight, he says, my time is not yet come or my time is not yet full. Again, he's talking about the set of proper time. The disciples or his family specifically were trying to urge him to go to Jerusalem and make himself known as Messiah. And he's saying, no, 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 no. My time, the set of proper time, the timetable that is the prophetic time clock is not yet come. It's not time for me yet to be cut off in the middle of that 70th week. And then in Matthew 26, verse 18, as he's getting closer to the fulfillment of his time, he says to his disciples, go into such and such a city and say to such a man, uh, the master says, my time is at hand. Guess what? That's the same word, the set or proper time. Jesus knew that his time was at hand. I will keep the fat Passover at my house with my, uh, thy, thy house with my disciples. Paul also confirms. Now, the point we're trying to make here is that, you know, we talk about the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, and we talk about day for a year. We quote, you know, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, and Ezekiel chapter four, verse six. But we, many times we miss all of these New Testament affirmations. We miss where Jesus says, my time is, uh, the time is fulfilled. And where John, Jesus says in John, my time has not yet come. And then he says, no, my time has come. And then he's, Peter says, excuse me, Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter two, verse six, that Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom to be testified in due time. And also says in Romans 5, 6, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What is that all pointing to? Well, the six, 69 weeks of 483 prophetic days or literal years take us to 27 AD. From 27 AD to 34 AD is the final week of that 70 week prophecy. The one the dispensationalists try to throw up into the future and apply to the Antichrist. It doesn't apply to the Antichrist, it applies to Jesus Christ. In the middle of that final week, he was gonna be cut off. That's an Old Testament word for tasting the second death. Mm -hmm. It's talking about him dying for our sins. In the middle of that week, he was gonna be cut off. And in the re remaining three and a half years of that week, the covenant was gonna be confirmed by those that heard it, according to Hebrews chapter two and verse three. So you have this beautiful prophecy pointed to the Messiah. William Miller was on the cusp, just on the very edge of understanding all of it. He didn't quite get the event because he and his associates had a misunderstanding of the sanctuary. They thought it was the earth rather than a heavenly sanctuary. But Paul comes on strong and so does the rest of the New Testament believers in affirming that 70 week prophecy and its application to Jesus Christ. Then we have this warning. It's a rebuke in a sense. Christ is rebuking the religious leaders of his day in Luke chapter 12 and verse 56. He says, you don't discern this time. You don't discern this set or proper time. And then in Luke chapter 21, he has a rebuke, not just for the religious leaders of his day, but for us also. Christ warns that false teachers would come in the end of time. False teachers, as Pastor Loma King pointed out very clearly in the history of the Jesuits who developed this theory of preterism and futurism, false teachers would come, Jesus says, and say, the time is near. Now, Luke 21, parallels Matthew 24 and Mark 13. It is uh, a parallel prophetic prophecy or prophetic chapter to Daniel and Revelation. Luke 21, Jesus Christ is telling us about the signs of the end. Many times we turn to Matthew 24, but Luke 21, Mark 13, just as substantial, just as important. And Luke 21 has this unique warning. You don't find it in Matthew, you don't find it in Mark's uh, end time chapter, Luke 21. There's gonna be false teachers that will say, the time draws near, the setter appointed time, the time of the timetable in the 70 weeks, it is drawing near. Christ here is clearly pointing out this misinterpretation of the scriptures that was developed by Jesuits and has had such a profound impact on the Christian world today. God wants to get our focus on Jesus. He is the only one that can fulfill the 70 week prophecy and therefore vindicate or establish the 2300 uh, day prophecy. That is the prophetic day for literal time prophecy that brings us to 1844 and the actual cleansing of the sanctuary. The last work of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, mediating on our behalf so that we have an advocate with the father if we sin, Jesus Christ the righteous, who's not only the advocate for 
our sins, but he's also the advocate for the sins of the entire world. Now is the time to study these prophecies. Now is the time to get your minds and your hearts into the Bible, into the Old and New Testament, and to understand these truths for yourselves so that you indeed can claim Jesus Christ as your advocate. Because as, as Pastor uh, Loma King said, there's no second probation. When Jesus comes, that's it. He that is righteous, he that is holy will be righteous and holy still. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rafferty. That lesson has me excited. Teachers will tell you that uh, to remember something, you need repetition. And we're going to do a little bit of that right now. I am Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson, The Longest Prophetic Timeline. Now, it's easy for some people to get lost in details. Cyrus, Xerxes, Ahasuerus, three commands to return, but only one of them is to restore and rebuild Jerusalem fully. 457 BC, that's so long ago. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks plus one week. It's all important, but I know sometimes we feel like we can forget things faster than we learn them. <clears throat> so let's get a hold of the big picture here. I want you to remember that we're dealing with a great controversy and in order for there to be a solution, it's got to be a great solution, a great rescue plan. So this is going to be no little, de 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 no little deal. So working with and through broken human beings to bring God's restoration to a kidnapped planet, it's not going to be something that happens in a moment or happens in a dark hidden corner somewhere. God is playing the long game for souls, hence the title here on Thursday's lesson, The Longest Prophetic Timeline. And so God reveals his timetable and it's not something that goes like this, hey, I'll be there next Tuesday. Mm. No. Not because God lacks the power, but because it takes time and effort to reveal the deception of the enemy to deceived men and women who don't think that they are deceived. It takes some time. So God's long-term prophecies here reveal that he is not fickle. He is, he is committed, he is deliberate, and he is planned in what he does, and we get to be a part of it. So let's look at the big picture, a little bit of the background that leads us to Daniel chapter 9, where I am today. I want to take you back to Daniel 2 just for a minute where we see a, a beautiful statue made by humans and then from outside a rock comes and that rock is Jesus and that rock from outside destroys the beautiful image that we've made. And that's good news, but what gives Jesus the right to destroy this beautiful image that we made? Well, the answer is found in the next prophetic chapter, Daniel chapter 7, where we see one like the Son of Man coming into the courts of judgment. That's Jesus once again. And he has the right to destroy and replace human governments with his own because the court has been seated, judgment has been made, and the sentence has been pronounced. And therefore, the sentence must get executed there in chapter 2. But what gives Jesus the right to judge us, to pronounce sentence on us? We move to the next prophetic chapter, chapter 8, and we see a high priest. Now, the word high priest is not used there, but comparing scripture with scripture, we recognize the clear picture here that there's a high priest who cleanses the sanctuary. Once again, that's Jesus. And Jesus has inspected every square inch, every split second of humanity's history carefully, and his knowledge is undefiled, and it is perfect and clear. And for our good, he identifies for destruction, every polluting sin. But what has he done that makes him worthy to examine us? What gives him the right to examine us? Mm -hmm. Moving on through the prophetic story to chapter 9, we see then the Messiah who is cut off. He has taken on himself the debt of sin and he has offered his own self alone to be sacrificed to pay for every single sin. Therefore, he must inspect and discover everything that needs to be cleansed. The big picture of the prophetic story always zooms right in on Jesus mm -hmm. and the closer you look at it, it's all about him. And all the prophetic timelines of, Daniel, of the whole book of Daniel hinge on Daniel chapter 9, uh, the Messiah's life being cut off. If the Messiah's mission in Daniel 9 is not completed, then what happens in Daniel 8 can't happen. Daniel 7 can't happen. Mm -hmm. Daniel 2 can't happen. So everything focuses on Daniel 5 here. Daniel so, 9, right. Daniel 9. But is this just poetic theological imagery or is there proof? 
Yes, <laughs> to strengthen our faith. God has pinpointed exactly when, so we can say we are resting on firm foundation. So let's read Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 to 27. I don't want to leave off 24, but I'm going to have to. Daniel 9, 25 to 27. Know therefore and understand. This is Gabriel the angel speaking to Daniel. That from, here's the anchor point, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem. All right, that's where it starts. Until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks connected together there. The street shall be built uh, again in the wall with even in troublesome times. Verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Mm -hmm. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant for many for one week. All right, this is tied together. We're not separating this off till a later time, yeah. but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So here's the great paradox in this lesson. God is the sovereign king, but at the start of this prophecy, uh, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, it is in the hands of a foreign human ruler. Why? Why would God do that? And here's why. The event has got to be public, verifiable, international, and conspicuous. All of history turns their attention on this command, which had a two-part lead up. And then all along the way, under four Persian rulers, opponents tried to stop it, turning more attention to what was going on there. And you can read about those opposition efforts in Ezra 4 and 5. God is not bound, though, by the, pagan, by the whims of a pagan king. His will will be carried out. And so you can read about that command to restore and rebuild in Ezra chapter 7 verses 7 to 26 and we know that it happened 457 BC. That's the date. It all starts now. 7 plus 62 plus one week, a united 70 week period multiplied by seven days in a week. That's 490 days. One day equals one year in Bible prophecy. 490 years was this fulfilled. We've already been through this but let's hear it one more time. Fulfilling verse 25, the Messiah, meaning anointed one, he was baptized and anointed by the Holy Spirit at 27 AD, 483 years at the end of the 69 weeks before that last week starts, and he was baptized on time right there exactly as God promised. 27 AD, fulfilling 26 and 27, verse 26 and 27, in the very center of the 70th week, after three and a half years of ministry, the Messiah is cut off, dies, sacrifices himself in the spring of AD 31, putting an end to the need for, sac for animal sacrifices. So give yourself permission right here to be impressed with God. This is not a little thing. We rush over this. Yeah, I've heard that so much. Whoa, God is amazing. He gave us all of that right here. This is not a minor coincidence hidden off in the corner of a Bible. This is for all to see. And so Jesus begins and ends his earthly ministry on time, just as promised. And Pastor Rafferty gave you a few of those texts. I'll give you one more here, Galatians 4.4. 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Amen. Desire of Ages, page 59, paragraph three we, three, we learn that the Magi in the East, they knew from the Old Testament that the Messiah's coming was near. How'd they know? They're studying these prophecies right here. The start of the Daniel 9 prophecy is also the starting point, as we learned, of the 2300 days. In fact, all of the time prophecies of Daniel, 1260, 1335, 490, they fit inside of this longest prophetic timeline. And we learn at the end of this 2300 days that that is a time when Jesus fulfills the prophecy of uh, beginning the judgment in heaven on time. Acts 17, 31 says he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Now, when we begin to, and when we help somebody else to understand the fulfillment of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, it opens several more important doors. Number one, this opens up the possibility that they will accept the day for the year principle when we see how history reveals that God's prophecies are fulfilled. And understanding the day for the year principle then opens up them to accepting the ending of the 2300 days in 1844.
And that's important because that opens up the possibility of considering a heavenly sanctuary and the ministry that Jesus is doing in this heavenly sanctuary right now that is soon to come to a conclusion. And so this then convicts people that Jesus coming is soon, the judgment hour is soon to be completed. And so is Daniel 9 important? Absolutely. This prophecy here, this longest, this longest Bible timeline begins with Jesus. And what does it conclude with? It concludes with Jesus. And what are the checkpoints all along the way? Those checkpoints are Jesus. And we are invited to look into it and open ourselves up to what he's done for us. Amen. Mm, amen. I love that. Take a moment to be impressed with God. <laughs> Praise God. I love that. Let's take some final moments uh, for some thoughts. Uh, yes, when we talk about Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy as Daniel and, and all three, as a matter of fact, everybody here today talked about how accurate it is and why it's so vitally important. Let's not guess and look at the opinions of our day. Let's allow God's word to sharpen our intellect. Mm -hmm. Second Peter 1 verse 19, and we have the prophetic word confirmed, or as the King James Version says, more sure, which you do well to take heed as the light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Study God's word and the light gets brighter and brighter and brighter. Amen. 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 Well, I want to remind you, Psalm 25, 9, the humble he guides in justice and the humble he teaches his way. He wants to teach you. He's willing to teach you. I leave you with this promise in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Amen, amen. And we know that Satan is bringing a lot of deception, a lot of distraction, a lot of counterfeit. We've talked about that. But God is also going to counter the counterfeit. One of the w w ways he does that is through new light and understanding. And we've got a lot of information that can help you to really nail down these prophecies. So remember to get a hold of this book, Messiah, uh, share these messages, uh, share, get a hold of the notes and share with your friends because Jesus is coming soon and we need to be established in the truth. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel saw that prophecy was fulfilling around him, the fall of Babylon to the Persian Empire. So he consulted the scrolls that revealed that rescue is soon, and he began to pray earnestly. We are seeing prophecy fulfilling. We know that rescue is soon. We've consulted God's word. And so we need to be a people who are praying earnestly. Mm, amen. Praise the Lord. I want to end with Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Fits the theme very well. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Okay. It says, from which we are eagerly, uh, where we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. I can't wait for that time to be able to see our Savior come and get us and take us home. Uh, be with us next week as we dive into lesson number eight, entitled Light from the Sanctuary.